Thank you for joining me in this podcast series. Since it's now very likely that we will not be able to celebrate Easter in our houses of worship this year, I wanted to give you another way of being close to Christ in this season. And that is by taking you on a virtual journey, a journey through the life and times of Jesus based on my book, In the Footsteps of Jesus. When it was released a few years ago by National Geographic as a large illustrated hardcover, the book surprisingly became a bestseller and has now been released as a softcover as well. So for the next few weeks, I'd like to take you on a journey with Jesus from his earliest days in Nazareth to his ministry in Galilee. And then just before Easter, I will take you to Jerusalem and retrace the hours of his passion from the Last Supper to his death and resurrection. As those of you who have read my books know, I am a historian. I am not a theologian or a priest, but someone who is fascinated with the the Jesus of history and all the things that forensic archaeology, the gospel literature, as well as Roman and Jewish documents can tell us about the life and times of Jesus. But I'm also a practicing Christian. I'm a hospitality minister here at our Church of St. Monica's in Santa Monica. And so I always try to be respectful of church traditions and the difference and the different ways that we as humans try to interpret the teachings of Jesus. So with that, take your pilgrim's staff and together Let's travel back to Galilee in the first century. And the first thing we notice when we do that is that Galilee is really a a very beautiful country. Um, I always um, believe it is really to the credit of the Israeli government that when you go through Galilee, you see this beautiful land pretty much as it was in the days of Jesus Christ. There are no high rises, there is no high rise development, uh, very few signs of modern life. And it's really to the credit of the Israeli government that we can still enjoy Galilee uh, as pretty much it was in the days of, of Jesus. I'm going to reduce my window a little bit so we can see the pictures that I'm going to show you. Now there is lots that we have learned about the days of Jesus in just the last 10 to 15 years. For example, uh, we've discovered um, the sarcophagus, who presumably was a sarcophagus that held the body of Herod the Great, as well as coins such as this pruta that dates from his period. So certainly the historical figure of Herod the Great has become much more real and tangible in just the last 10 to 15 years. At the same time, there are other characters in the great story of Jesus that now are attested as historical figures, such as, for example, this this ossuary, which, uh, as you can see in the inscription, uh, reportedly holds the remains of the high priest Caiaphas, or Caiapha, in Aramaic. Now, an ossuary is a unique form of burial that was practiced throughout the uh, Middle East uh, in these days. Uh, In the climate of the Middle East, a uh, body will decompose very quickly, usually in the span of one year. And after that, what is left are the bones. And so typically when that happens, those bones are contained in a much smaller box, such as this ossuary, so that the space in the tomb in which typically the body is laid, at least for the the wealthy, for the affluent, that space can then be made made free for another burial in in the future. So that's why we typically see that uh, famous people, affluent people, prominent people, such as, for example, the high priest, uh, after within a year of his death, that his remains would be reburied in a um, ossuary such as this. And this, of course, is a tremendous attestation of another historical character from, from the time of Jesus. 
very exciting discovery it was made in Caesarea, which, uh, as some of you know, is, uh, was the ancient port city of Judea in the time of Jesus. And uh, this stone, this marker stone, was discovered there. And it reads, and um, I'm going to translate this now into English, to the divine Augustus, this Tiberium, uh, this is a building dedicated to the emperor of that time, which was Tiberius, Pontius Pilate, you can very clearly see the name U.S. and then Pilate, Prefect of Judea, Prefectus Judea, uh, has dedicated. So what this stone is telling us, this stone, is that uh, clearly Pontius Pilate was a historical figure and that uh, during his term as governor of Judea, which at the time was a Roman crown province, uh, that he built certain things. And what you did in those days is whenever you built something, you dedicated it to your boss, in this case, Emperor Tiberius. Uh, so the divine Augustus refers not to Emperor Augustus as we know him, but to the divine, to Tiberius, who of course would inherit the name of Augustus since he was of that same Julian family. Lots of other interesting things have happened. Of course, Tiberius himself is a very clearly attested figure, as you can see from this bust, which uh, is in the Louvre Museum, and some of these beautiful coins that were struck during uh, his reign. This is an aureus, which means it's the, the, the most valuable coin in circulation at that time, made of, of gold. Of course, all of these people were principally Romans or vassal kings in the employ of Rome. And most people in rural Galilee would not have a tombstone. So we must look for other documents, other signs, other evidence of their life and times. And that is what I try to do in this series of podcasts. For example, look at this gorgeous orchard of olive trees. I mean, you could walk through that orchard and really feel yourself transported to the time of Christ, can you not? And that is actually a very important thing for you to remember as we go through this podcast series. And that is that Galilee was exceptional because of its great fertility. For much of Galilee's history, since the earliest days of the Israelite settlement, all the way through the life and times of Jesus, Galilee served as the breadbasket of the Near East. Um, all of the wonderful uh, vegetables and fruits, and wheat that was cultivated here, would not only feed the peasants who owned ancestral plots here for many generations, but it would also be used uh, to barter trade with the surrounding regions. And that's why it's, it's interesting that we rarely hear of trouble in Galilee, unlike, of course, the, the many, many stories of uprisings and rebellions that we hear in Judea. And there's a, a reason for that, and I will get to that later in this series and explain why uh, so suddenly the time of Jesus was so very different from the times that preceded his era. The reason why Galilee is so fertile then and to this day is because Israeli archaeologists have discovered that there are aquifers. These are large subterranean containers of water throughout the valleys of Galilee, particularly the, the Beit Netofa Valley, where, of course, Jesus grew up. And that's where we see uh, this tremendous fertility that sustained much of the peasantry at, at, uh, at their time. Now, Isaiah calls Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I think the reason is that Galilee was always very different from the heartland of Judea. You know, we, when we listen to the stories in the gospels, we tend to conflate them. We don't tend to necessarily make a distinction between what happened in Galilee, what happened in Judea, but that's very wrong. The two had always been very, very different. And one of the reasons is, of course, that when we go to the book of uh, the books of Kings it, uh, in the Bible, it tells us very clearly that uh, 
Galilee was part of the northern kingdom, the Israelite kingdom in the north, while Judah in the south formed a separate kingdom uh, called the southern kingdom. Now, as scholars, we tend to debate uh, how these two kingdoms really originated. Uh, the Hebrew Bible tells us that originally there was a unified kingdom that after the reigns of David and Solomon broke up into the north and south. Uh, today, scholars tend to place some question marks behind that, but we're not going to go into that right now. We're going to assume that uh, Judah and Galilee were for part of two, two very, very different kingdoms, and the sense of alienation between these two lands, which would continue into the time of Jesus, uh, that's when that began. Now, here is something very important to realize, that after the Assyrians began to invade the northern kingdom, including Galilee, first as a vassal state, and then actually as a conquered nation in which many, many local people were deported, and the region of Galilee was resettled with Asian veterans and other displaced peoples, uh, Galilee became, of course, a place with many, many foreign peoples. Uh, many different languages were spoken. Many people who were not Jewish lived in Galilee. And, and so you see, for example, that after the Babylonian exile, after Jerusalem fell, the temple was destroyed, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor, uh, displaced many of the elites uh, to Babylonia. Um, uh, these regions were then resettled again by other peoples from throughout the empire. But after the Babylonian exile, uh, the Persians who took over from the Assyrians specifically granted Judah its autonomy. They even allowed uh, the Persian emperor uh, Cyrus the Great uh, allowed the Judeans to rebuild uh, the temple in Jerusalem. It was not nearly as glamorous as it was originally as built by Solomon, but it was still a functioning temple. We call that the second temple, and this is where the so-called second temple period starts. However, Galilee was not. While Judah became sort of a, an autonomous region ruled by a theocracy of Jewish sages and priests. Galilee remained firmly under the thumb of these new overlords, now the Persians, uh, precisely because of the tremendous fertility of God. They didn't want to give that up. There was not a whole lot of resources in Judea. It was very dry. Uh, there was not a whole lot of arable land. A lot of it was desert. So they, were, they didn't have a problem, you know, giving them a sense of autonomy. But Galilee was very valuable. They needed the fertility of Galilee to feed the peoples of their empire. And then you see that when the, uh, of course, then the Greeks come in. I'm not going to give you the whole story now. But when the Greeks come in, first the Ptolemies in the wake of Alexander the Great, and then the so-called Seleucid Empire, the Syrians uh, take over this region. Uh, then you see, of course, that uh, Judah, Judea, now called Judea, um, rises in revolt uh, against this Greek opposition uh, where people are trying to suppress the Jewish worship. They want to make the temple in Jerusalem a Greek temple devoted to Zeus, the Greek. I mean, what were they, what were they thinking? <laughs> you know? And so obviously that precipitates a revolt, which we call the Maccabean Revolt is described in the uh, pseudo-canonical books of the Maccabees. And then you see that after a long struggle, Judea in 142 before the Common Era is liberated, but Galilee is still part of the Seleucid Empire. And it will take another 40 years before they are finally conquered by this new entity, of the independent Judea, which we call the Hasmonean kingdom, uh, they are finally incorporated as well. And right from the get-go, you will see that there is great suspicion. And this is just, you know, just a hundred years before the birth of Christ. There is great suspicion uh, 
between Judea, which is the heartland of Judaism, which is where people remain faithful to Jewish, the Jewish law, the Jewish rites of sacrifice, and this, this territory up where, the Galilee of the Gentiles, where so many different peoples have settled, where, where foreign blood has been intermingled with Jewish blood. And, and so there's a great cultural rift between Galilee, the homeland of Jesus, and Judea, which of course then rapidly became once again the center of, of Jewish worship. You know, in, in John's Gospel, someone asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? I mean, <laughs> Duh! I mean, what a what a what a what a concept! You know, he obviously he comes from Bethlehem. You know, the Messiah we are told uh, must be of the Davidic line. So why would anyone suggest that he would be coming from some Podong village in in Nazareth? You know, and this is why these these statements in the gospel suddenly become so so obvious. Uh, in that same gospel, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, who is uh, Bartholomew in some of the other Gospels says, uh, Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come from Nazareth? Yeah. So once again, you see the, the tremendous uh, suspicion, the prejudice, uh, and the social tensions between uh, the Galileans and the Judeans. Now, uh, I wanted to give you this map because uh, something very important happened here, and, uh, and, and just around the birth of Christ, uh, you know, the birth of Christ is typically the year zero, according to our chronology. Um, but we know from the Gospels uh, that Jesus was born in the final days of the kingdom of Herod the Great. The Gospels are very, very clear on that, right? Uh, well, Herod the Great died in 4 BC. Uh, we know that. Uh, so clearly, Jesus must have been born around 4 BC, which means that he was uh, part of, well, at least as an infant, he may not have been aware of it, but his parents certainly were, of a tremendous upheaval that attended the breakup of the kingdom of Herod in those days. Let me briefly tell you what happened. Um, Herod the Great was appointed by the Romans to take control of this particular area, which was um, under control of the Parthians at the time. And so Herod was uh, authorized by the Roman Senate to go to Judea and, and with forces partly supplied by Rome to uh, conquer the region and to make it a vassal kingdom, a vassal kingdom that could operate as an autonomous kingdom, but in any way, shape, or form was a vassal state, which means, A, you did what the emperor told you, and B, you every year you paid tribute, uh, which was uh, up to 30% of your, of your national gross domestic product. Uh, and that story I'm going to address later on in my podcast series. Well, um, Herod ruled uh, the kingdom as a police state. Um, people were encouraged to inform upon one another. And that's why uh, Herod built a series of fortresses around his kingdom, including the fortress of Masada, which I'm sure you've heard of, and also the fortress of Machaerus, which is down here all below, uh, which is where John the Baptist was uh, put to death uh, by Herod Antipas. And so when, when Herod died, in 4 BC, everybody was very eager to, uh, to read his will. And everybody expected to have one of his sons, his son Herod Antipas, which we referred to him as Antipas to uh, distinguish him from his father Herod, though the gospels don't make necessarily a difference between the two. They refer to Herod as both the father and the son. But um, Antipas, one of his many sons, he had nine, three were killed by the father because they were suspected of, uh, of a conspiracy, whether that's right or wrong, we never know. But he had six sons, and of those, Herod Antipas was originally identified as the crown prince. He was the crown prince, that means he would inherit the kingdom. And then very strangely, very mysteriously, just before uh, his death, Herod 
changed his will. It sounds like an Agatha Christie mystery, doesn't it? Uh, he changed his will. And he decided to break up his kingdom that he had so fought so hard for to put together. And many people were surprised by that, but this is what he did. He gave his, uh, his son Archelaus the large part, uh, the main part of Israel, which was the heartland of Judea, which as you know by now was the core of the Jewish identity at the time. So the, the major territory of Judea, including Jerusalem, was going to be given to his son Archelaus, who they all took their father's name. So Herod Archelaus was going to become the ruler in the heartland of Judea. Now, Herod Antipas, who was uh, itching to become the king, uh, was very disappointed to find out that he was only going to be, get the territory of Galilee up here. You can see Nazareth, you can see Tiberias and uh, Capernaum. So all of a sudden, from becoming the king, he was being uh, demoted uh, to that of the ruler or tetrarch, which really means in Greek, a ruler of a fourth, which is really what it was, a fourth of the kingdom. Uh, so he became tetrarch of Galilee. And then something very strange happened. Um, uh, Herod also gave him a territory that is not at all part of Galilee, but part of uh, today, uh, of Jordan, which is the territory called Perea. Perea. And that's this territory right here. You can see it runs along the River Jordan. Uh, Jericho uh, up to an, uh, part of the Dead Sea. This, this is today part of the Kingdom of Jordan. And uh, I'm going to show you lots of pictures of that territory in this series. And, um, and be, that, that was kind of strange because as you can see, the two are not connected in any way. And this explains why it is um, Antipas, Tetrarch Antipas, who goes and arrests John the Baptist because John the Baptist was operating not in Galilee, as you know, but along the River Jordan, right here in the wilderness of Jordan. So because Herod Antipas had this appendix of Perea, that is why he now had jurisdiction over the territory where John the Baptist was operating. John the Baptist, probably the most famous dissident of his day. We, we're going to have a, a podcast about him as well. And so that's why uh, he had jurisdiction about both these territories. There was a third major part, the Golanitis, we call that pars pro toto, because in addition to the Golanitis, which is today the Golan, the Golan Heights, all the way well deep into today's Syria, as you can see, uh, as well as parts of what is today northern Jordan, all that was given to an other son of, um, of Herod, and, um, and that was Herod Philip. So we have three, uh, three sons now ruling the kingdom of Herod the Great. We have Archelaus ruling Judea. We have a very disappointed Antipas trying to comfort himself with just Galilee. And we have Philip who has a far greater territory uh, the Golanitis. Now, interestingly enough, the Golanitis, this territory, straddled a region called the Decapolis, which is a series of large towns. And this region, unlike Galilee and unlike Judea, was uh, almost entirely Gentile. So therefore, all of the Jewish turmoil, all of the, the, the Jewish conflicts, the tensions that arose between uh, the Jews on the one hand and the Romans, their occupiers on the other, uh, were not present in this area. And so while we go through these terrible times uh, throughout the first century uh, with Judea and Galilee and the Roman forces invading uh, during the Jewish war, uh, the Golanitis was largely insulated from that. And these people continued to live in their cities and towns. They worshiped Greek gods, did a lot of commerce, they were very wealthy as we will see in another area. So that is essentially the story, the place in which we set our tale. This, here it is, Galilee, a gorgeous place 
Uh, Josephus says it was uh, divided into Upper Galilee and Lower Galilee, and of course, our story will take place mostly in this area, uh, around Capernaum in northern uh, Galilee. We will travel around the Sea of Galilee in my next podcast, and I'll show you some of the places where we believe Jesus uh, docked the boat and went ashore. Uh, and then he also, as we are told, when he found that so many Gentiles were coming to hear him speak, that was a very new development. You know, typically there were lots of uh, speakers and sages and prophets in, in the first century um, who, who talked and who preached, and they rarely attracted any, any folks from the surrounding Gentile areas. But, but Jesus uh, attracted a, a very large following from apparently from Tyre, and Sidon, these are cities in Phoenicia, which is thoroughly Hellenized, thoroughly Greek in its, uh, in its makeup. So Jesus was, was quite surprised that all of a sudden he would see so many of the generals. And that's why near the end of his ministry, he decided to go and go into this territory. And so the Gospels tell us very clearly that he went into this region. I don't think he went into the cities themselves, but he went into this territory and was amazed by the faith that he found among the uh, Gentiles. These were non-Jews, and yet they really cleave, they, they cleave to his words much more, as he would later say, than those where he had preached in the original ministry triangle of uh, Capernaum uh, and surrounding cities. So this is, this is where we will tell our tale. And here is that Beth Netofa Valley, the Beit Netofa Valley in, in Hebrew, uh, which is so important. As you can see, it's a very fertile land, again, because of these invisible aquifers that, make, that makes Gal even today Galilee so exceptionally rich and this is where Jesus grew up. This is where he grew up. Now, after Jesus was born, there was a particular process that Mary had to go through in order to restore her state of purity. You know, according to uh, Leviticus, according to the Jewish law, the Torah, for the first seven days after the birth of, uh, of Jesus, Mary was ritually impure. That means that she, she was not able to uh, go to the temple or to meaningfully interact with, uh, with anyone in the village. Uh, but then at the eighth day, of course, uh, Jesus uh, was circumcised as a, as a Jewish child. And then for the next 33 days, Mary was still not allowed to touch certain things, such as holy things, which means she couldn't go to the temple necessarily. Uh, but she could, of course, fully engage with her family, she could kiss her child, hug her child, she could kiss Joseph, she could uh, meet with, with other uh, women in the village. And I think this is such a beautiful thing in the Jewish law, because what these 33 days really meant is that uh, the women in the village took care of her and all of the housekeeping things that needed to be done around the house, the cleaning and the cooking and so forth, so that Mary could really bond with her child. She could really develop that tremendous maternal bond between her and Jesus. And I think that's one of the many beautiful things that we can see in, in the Jewish law. Now, after that particular period of 33 days, it would be 40 days, so the child had been a, a daughter, but clearly Jesus uh, was a boy. Leviticus also specified that uh, the new mother should then sacrifice a lamb at the temple in Jerusalem in order to fully restore her state of purity, which means that she could fully engage with uh, her community at that time. Uh, of course, Leviticus recognized that um, not many people could uh, afford uh, a first year la a lamb of, of uh, one year uh, those were expensive animals, certainly if they were fit to be sacrificed. So Leviticus allowed for that by saying that if you were poor, that your family could suffice with only two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And I find it so striking that when you go to the Gospel of Luke, 
That's exactly what Luke says. Luke says that Mary and Joseph went to the temple and offered a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, almost paraphrasing Leviticus, which tells us that, that they were indeed uh, very, very poor, very poor people. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean for Jesus as a child? Well, I, I went to a, a very special place uh, in uh, the north of Israel. It's close to the Syrian border called Katrin. And in Katrin, they have, of Katrin, they have uh, recreated uh, what life in first century Galilee would be like. And so this gives us a wonderful idea of uh, the early years of Jesus and life in a village such as Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a very small village. If you've been to Israel, it was nothing like the, uh, the Nazareth of today. Uh, Josephus, I've, I refer to him, I will refer to him several times. It's a Jewish historian from the first century. So he writes from personal observation. But he wrote in his book that there were about 204 villages and townships in Galilee at the time, and uh, that list does not include Nazareth. So we know that Nazareth must have been so small as a hamlet that it escaped Josephus' attention. But this is typically what a home would have been looked like. So it's a, it's a composite of stone, uh, basal stone, basalt stone, uh, quarry in that particular area, and then covered with lattice work, very much as Mark, the Gospel of Mark describes uh, the first miracle of Jesus, you know, when they take away the roof, remember that story, and they lower uh, the man, the paralytic, down you know, so that he could be healed by Jesus. Well, you can see right there the lattice work on top of, of that roof. That's exactly how those homes were made. This uh, was probably Mary's kitchen. Uh, Mary's kitchen would have looked something like this. And you can see that uh, uh, she has several appliances. Um, here is her stove, her little oven, uh, where she baked bread, which of course was the, was the principal uh, source, the principal way of cooking in those days, a little oven. And here is a very important appliance, and that is the mill. Let me, let me make my video a little smaller so you can see it. Uh, this is uh, the stone mill. What happened is in the morning when she baked bread, that's what women did. They would get up early in the morning and they would bake bread for their families. They would get a jar with the wheat and they would pour the wheat kernels into this little hole. You see that in the center? And the kernels would then drop in between these two rolling stones. And then she would... Uh, uh, get a hold of this wooden handle and move it back and forth, back and forth. And so the motion of the two stones would grind the wheat kernels and turn it into flour. And the flour would then drop down to the bottom where she could collect it. Uh, that was the most important thing that, um, that a mother did in, in first century Galilee. And, and so wonderful that Jesus pays tribute through that quintessential uh, tradition of baking bread in the morning in, his, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, give today our daily bread. I mean, that's, that's such a quintessential part of Galilean life. And then after she had created the flour, she would mix it with uh, water, uh, with a bit of salt and some olive oil, and then knead it into dough, right? It would become dough. And uh, of course, uh, it would ferment um, so that it could rise. And then she would make, turn the dough into flat uh, pancakes almost, very flat round cakes, very similar to what you see in the Middle East today. Because if you make the dough thin, it would rise and bake more quickly. That's why it spread out, because it would rise and bake much more quickly. Those flat patties then went into the oven which was kindled with uh, kindle and branches and, and wood. And thus, uh, she would bake her bread as soon as the, the scent of that baking bread would go through the house. Of course, everybody would wake up, 
And uh, that's how the day would begin for Jesus uh, as a child. They would all sit around uh, the oven in wintertime or outside in the courtyard. I'll show you in a minute. And they would sit together as a family and have bread with a little bit of olive oil sprinkled on it with water. And uh, the kids would play. The young mothers of the village would gossip. And, uh, and the men would scratch their beards and talk about the harvest and, and things that were going on in the village. And wonderful uh, scene that we can imagine there for daily life in, in Galilee. Now, of course, Mary had um, some cups and, and jars such as these to, to preserve important food stuff such as oil. Olive oil was uh, very much part of everything that a, that a mother did not only for cooking, but also for healing. It had important healing elements. And of course, she wouldn't use these fancy glass or gold or copper vessels that have been excavated uh, in Jerusalem, uh, which the, the wealthy used for poor families. Uh, these terracotta, these things were made of terracotta, of baked clay, terracotta. And so this, this uh, vessel here on the right is very much what you typically would see if you had walked into Mary's kitchen at that time. And they would drink water uh, out of these very simple terracotta cups. I took these pictures in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, which is a museum not many people go to for the simple reason that it doesn't have any explanations. It doesn't have any captions or anything like that. It's really for specialists. But it is one of the richest uh, uh, resources of archaeological objects of Israel that we know. And so whenever I, I always go there every time I go to Jerusalem, but you may find three or four people walking around there. It's, um, you know, of course, if you go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, there's many, many more objects. And of course, there, there are wonderful captions and descriptions uh, written there. But I think the truly uh, important objects are in uh, the Rockefeller Museum, which is supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, by the way. That's a whole different story. This is what a typical home would look like. Um, and you can see it's a very simple home and uh, you're built again of those stone blocks, uh, not necessarily mortared, but fit together uh, with uh, a mixture of sand and seashells. Uh, that's how they would create a, a mortar in those days. And you can see um, the furniture is very, very simple. And the reason is, and we'll get to that in my next podcast, that wood was very sparse uh, in Galilee. Wood was extremely sparse. Uh, the tree that grows in abundance uh, now and back then is the olive tree. And anyone who's ever tried to work olive wood knows that it's a very, very difficult wood to, to use for carpentry. And that's why um, uh, there was hardly any furniture in a typical peasant home such as this one. I even think that this table that they've put here is a bit of a stretch for a family uh, like Mary and Joseph. They probably would have been sitting on the, on the ground, on the soil, uh, which is uh, hardened soil. And they probably would have had uh, some form of, uh, of carpet or tapestry to uh, protect them to sit on the floor and that's how they would eat together. I'm not sure if that table is quite historical. Here's a ladder. Uh, there would be an elevated area, an elevated room where the, the couple would sleep. Once again, you can see that lattice work uh, as the roof, um, which uh, again is described so well in the Gospel of Mark. That could be very easily removed, very easily of course also rebuilt in times of winter. And it can get quite cold in Galilee. I've been there when it was quite cold. Uh, snow is not uncommon uh, in an area or rainstorms. So um, it was very likely that you would have to rebuild the roof uh, um, every other year or so in case uh, this, uh, the seasons were quite harsh. And the same up here in the bedroom where uh, the, the, um, the height to the roof was much smaller, of course, because people would end up just to sleep and this was the uh, living space. Now what's interesting is when you look a little closer, you see this elevated uh, uh, um, uh, shelf. Uh, why is that elevated? You see that? The, the shelf is suspended from uh, the, the roof. Uh, why? To keep it away from vermin. Uh, 
uh, and, and other animals that might creep into your home. So this is where Mary kept her, the wheat, the olive oil, all of the precious things that animals may want to get to, edibles, maybe leftover uh, bread from the previous day. So that was suspended so that um, uh, the vermin could not uh, get at that. And here you see a hearth. Uh, this is where they would light a fire in wintertime. Again, it could get very cold. There was no chimney as such, so the smoke would fill the room. There was very little they could do about that. Uh, but that's how this family would have lived. Uh, now, typically, a home like that would, would have a small area for storage. Uh, this is a threshing uh, implement. I'll talk about that in the next episode, what, what that means. Um, and here you see all of the uh, farming implements that a, a farmer would have, including, of course, other storage. This is also where the animals would live. So if you had goats or, or sheep uh, or chickens, uh, for that matter, um, this is where they would be kept, uh, again, in, uh, in wintertime when it was cold outside. In the summer, they would just scamper around uh, outside. It was sort of the storage cabinet of, uh, of Mary and Joseph. Now, one very important thing that uh, Mary had uh, among her possessions, the very, very few possessions she would have as a poor woman, is this loom. Now, this is a, a single bar loom, which means that the loom is suspended with weights. And that allow, when it's suspended, that allows, allows Mary to, to weave uh, the wool or the flax in between uh, these strings and thus create garments. Now, why is that so important? Because in the time of Jesus and much of Jewish history, it was the responsibility of the mother to create the clothes for her family. That was one of the, the, her key responsibilities. You couldn't go down to the local uh, Nordstrom's or Target and, and buy um, pre a uh, fashion uh, that doesn't exist, of course. Uh, and so it was different for the wealthy. They had you know, all kinds of people who would create the most beautiful garments for them in Jerusalem. But up here in the North in Galilee, it was up to the mother. And you can see there's this beautiful uh, garment. You see that here? Um, this garment, uh, it, it's sort of, it's a, a sleeveless garment uh, because it is exactly the width of the loom on your left. Do you see that? So these garments were basically, they consisted of two strips of cloth, the full width of the loom. And then at the end, they were stitched together to create um, what looked like a t-shirt, essentially. We would call it a t-shirt today. Of course, for a woman, uh, the, it would go all the way down to her ankles, and, and men would also have it in, in two separate parts. They would have an upper part and a lower part. That We will talk about that when we talk about uh, John the Baptist. So the loom was the primary way, and this is another picture from Kazarina. They, the, they have done a wonderful job of restoring uh, the single uh, loom. In later periods, later in the first century, uh, they developed the two bar loom, which means that there was now a bar similar to the one up here on the bottom, which allowed the warp thread to be far more taut. And that made um, moving the woof back and forth across the warp much, much easier. But I doubt that was the case in the time of Mary, uh, the double bar uh, womb, uh, loom did not occur in the latter part of the first century. So I think this is accurate, that Mary would have used a loom such as this one. And in fact, if you look at Jewish documents of the period, one of the first things that a young girl would be taught uh, when she became six or seven years old, when her fingers were sufficiently developed, the mother would teach the daughter how to create garments on, on the loom. Now, there were, of course, a few things that were indispensable, even for a poor woman like Mary. And I, I just picked two here. Uh, these are hairpins, again, from the collection of the Rockefeller Museum. And here is a, a beautiful comb. Uh, this is from the Israel uh, Museum. This was recovered in the 
in a cave um, in, in the Judean desert during the second Jewish rebellion. Now we're talking about 135 uh, in the common era or AD. Um, and these, I think, were probably implements that, that over time Mary uh, would be given perhaps as part of her dowry, uh, perhaps as a gift from Joseph, who was a very, who was a very handy person, as we will see. So I think we, could, we can reasonably accept that for her personal, um, for her personal beauty um, and, and um, cosmetics, if you will, uh, Mary would have had hairpins like these to hold up her hair while she worked at the loom or at the oven um, and then uh, during the day because very much uh, the things that we today associate with Islam was also true for ancient Judaism. Uh, women covered their hair and tied up their hair and covered it uh, as they went about uh, the village. And of course, for combing her hair at night as she alone was sat alone with Joseph before going to bed, she would use this, this comb to, to comb her hair. Well, here is a, a little courtyard. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because many of these little homes that I, that I showed you were probably built around a communal courtyard. We, we've excavated many, many, many of these types of settlements where you have a multi-person, multi-family, multi-family dwelling around a common courtyard. Now, why was that? It was so that, one, for mutual protection. Um, obviously, um, these multiple homes are all facing inwards which gives them a measure of protection against wild animals, which were definitely uh, a problem in, uh, in Upper Galilee, as well as in times of war, but also for the protection of children. If you had little children, you know, that you could let them loose, <laughs> you could let them go into this inner courtyard. As a mother, you didn't have to worry about it because, you know, they couldn't go anywhere. They were protected uh, by this courtyard. And of course, it also had a very important social aspect. This is where these different families in a larger family or clan, this is where they would congregate during much of the day. This is perhaps where they would have their share their bread, where they would share their meals, where they maybe had a little campfire at night, where they told their stories. You know, that at nighttime, this is what the adults did. They would sit around and, and tell each other stories, which is why all of the great a foundational epics of human civilization, not just Hebrew Bible, but the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and the Mahabharata, uh, all of these great uh, foundational epics are all stories. They're all stories. They're stories were the ancient way of containing information and passing it on. And this is where typically uh, that took place. So all in all, I think the uh, settlement of Kasserim gives us a, a really beautiful idea of what life for Jesus, Mary and Joseph, was like in those early, early years. Now, this is how we typically, and I'm going to end with this painting, and then we're going to start with my next podcast to talk about the youth of Jesus and the years of his adolescence. Uh, this is what we imagine that uh, life for Jesus would have been. This is a painting by a pre-Raphaelite British artist, John Everett Millay, uh, Christ in the House of His Parents. And he, and he captures that beautifully, right? Uh, there is Joseph. Uh, we can see him. He's a carpenter. And you can see he's got lots of wood, you know. It's almost like he went to Home Depot. Of course, there was no Home Depot then in those days. Lots of wood in the back. Um, where from which he is fashioning this wonderful door. Uh, maybe he's building it for a client of his. And, um, and outside we can see the sun is shining. Uh, there are sheep. And it's a wonderful day. Very peaceful, peaceful time for Jesus' um, years of adolescence. And here poor Jesus has uh, hurt his hand on one of the nails that Joseph carelessly uh, left on the table, perhaps. So poor Jesus has, has hurt his hand, and uh, Mary is uh, comforting her son. Oh, it's okay. It'll, it'll be okay. Let me give it a kiss. While um, Mary's mother, Saint Anne, looks wisely because she knows that this is, of course, a sign of Jesus's future passion, which is a theme uh, 
that we see throughout the Middle Ages. The beautiful painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Saint Anne uh, reflects again that, that trilogy of, of Saint Anne knowing what Jesus uh, will go through as an, uh, as an adult and Mary being torn between her love for her child and her submission to God's will. Anyways, what I'm going to tell you in my next podcast, that virtually everything in this painting is wrong. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that um, we should not appreciate this painting for its great veneration quality, for its great inspirational quality. But the historical details of this painting are, are quite wrong. And I'm going to leave you with that. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, for my next podcast in this series, where we're going to look at young Jesus. Thank you so very much for uh, spending time with me and uh, I wish you all uh, a wonderful time and please, please be safe. Thank you.